Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about um, the region, but I thought I would put it in the context of uh, how I see the global uh, economy and European economy evolving, uh, where it's been, where it's going, and, uh, and I'll try to be provocative enough so we can um, uh, have time and uh, room for questions. So I'll start with the global economy, I'll talk a little bit about Europe, I'll try to talk about the uh, CECs, the new member states, uh, the uh, initial conditions from which they started, the convergence, it's a big debate to what extent there is and uh, what measures one might use. Obviously, political factors have come uh, to the forefront recently, and I'll have just a little vignette on Czechoslovak comparison since it's an interesting case to, to have and end up by pointing out that I think that Europe and uh, uh, this part of Europe in particular is at a crossroads and where do we, where do we head from there. So the global economy, as we already heard, is, um, you know, has ongoing uh, growth in GDP. There are optimistic forecasts. There is obviously a possibility of a trade war, so the degree of uncertainty has risen uh, significantly. The important thing for us here is that these optimistic upward revisions in uh, forecasts include Europe. Uh, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. And, of course, that's the main trading partner of uh, the CEC countries, the new member states. So just by way of uh, quick record and, and forecast, here you have the world economy, GDP, the advanced economies, the emerging uh, and developing countries. And what you see is that uh, there has been a growth of sort of three, three and a half uh, uh, percent in the world generally, and that uh, the advanced economies have been doing uh, much less well than the uh, emerging and developing economies in terms of rate of growth, uh, resulting in the aggregate. And within the advanced economies, uh, uh, there's been quite a lot of heterogeneity. The U.S. economy recovered earlier and is doing relatively well. Uh, Germany has been doing relatively well within the European context of the larger economies, but you can see uh, the Eurozone emerged from a recession still relatively recently. And, but now all the countries are doing relatively well, and the expectation is that they'll continue to do so. Now, obviously, the emerging uh, markets, uh, especially the large countries like China, uh, has been uh, the engine uh, of growth. Uh, there were some uh, hesitations uh, a couple of years ago. A lot of people were thinking China is really going to slow down and not be able to deliver the uh, 6 to 7 percent rate of growth. That seems to have been mistaken. It is going relatively fast, so it's no longer the 9 to 12 percent that uh, uh, were there in the past. But for an economy that's as large as China is now, to be able to go at 6.5% uh, year after year, and China has been growing for 40 years uninterrupted uh, really fast, that makes a, a huge difference, and I'll talk a little bit about it. India is doing relatively well as well, uh, but there are large economies like Brazil that went through a recession, as did Russia. But right now, all the engines of growth, literally almost all of them, are basically growing. So the world is in a very unusually good situation in terms of the macroeconomy, but the underlying worry is that there are lots of points of uncertainty and risk, which could change things dramatically, and the possible tra trade war that we're witnessing right now is a case in point. So this is the structure of the world economy, just to get our thoughts together. U US and uh, Europe account for about 40 six or seven percent, so still almost half of the world economy. China big at 15 percent right now. So three players account for two thirds of what's going on in the world. And if you add a few more, you have three quarters. So if one were to do an integrated policy, it's feasible. It's a small number of players who really still account for uh, what's, uh, what's going on in terms of what it is. The evolution is interesting. So you look at the structure of the world economy and you see that um, back in the 60s, uh, the US and uh, Europe uh, accounted for 65% uh, uh, or so of what was going on. Uh, in fact, still, if you look at uh, early 2000s, uh, they are at 60% uh, together, right? So the decline that we see in the relative importance of the United States and Europe in the world economy is the fastest decline that one observes in modern economic history in terms of relative importance. Uh, 
So they are still the most important, they still pretty much determine what's going on, but much less so than they did. And as you can see in the red color is where China comes in as a wedge in a big way. And obviously the uh, diminishing part is Japan, which uh, was the juggernaut, and, uh, and to some extent uh, uh, Europe and, and, and the US. Okay? Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, indeed, uh, if we were here in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and we're not focused on the Central Eastern Europe transition, uh, we would be talking about uh, how Japan and Europe have caught up with the United States and where they are going to overtake. Okay? And then the subsequent uh, two and a half, three decades suddenly uh, have given sort of a different uh, rise to the situation where Japan went through stagnation, slow growth for the third decade. Europe, instead of overtaking, has had a hard time uh, maintaining pace with the United States. The US was moving ahead much faster in many respects. Um, this is for historical perspective. This is how the world looked, according to uh, the Madison Project. Professor Madison is one of the best at looking historically at growth. How the world looked in 1820. Right? So what we now think of as the US and Europe was really India and China, China primarily. And uh, so it's important to keep that in mind that um, things can change dramatically. Notice how negligible was the US, 2% at the point. Europe, in terms of UK, France, Germany, roughly, uh, where they were then and are now. And uh, there is no doubt that in the kind of long-term perspective, long-term set of goals, that let's say the Chinese leaders have, this is the world that they are aspiring to. They want to return back to where they were, and the last two centuries were kind of an aberration uh, that uh, needs to be corrected. So, um, so it is indeed important to keep in mind kind of uh, how things can change, and both in the short run, matter of decade or two or three, as well as uh, longer run. So let's talk a little bit about Europe now, having this uh, short, brief global perspective. So this is how things look um, in uh, Europe right now. Germany, over 20%, UK, 16%, France, 15 etc. And a whole bunch of, uh, obviously, smaller countries, Austria, 2.3, and so on. Um, so again, you see some very important players, a lot of uh, smaller players, but clearly a very economy that could do very well, is capable of doing well, and the question is, you know, is it doing as well as it can, or can it do better uh, than that? Now, imagine that Britain pulls out, right, which is very likely with, with Brexit, so 16% goes away, and this is how the uh, economy will look uh, uh, after Brexit, with Germany representing a quarter, <laughs> France 18%, and so on and so forth. Right? So um, there is really uh, quite a lot of change going on in the global economy. We're focusing just on parts of it as, as a background. But it's important to keep in mind that the world is not stagnant in the sense of what's going on, the relative shares, and, uh, and the ability of different countries to exude dynamism, to really be innovative, be creative. Um, and this is where Europe uh, actually has, uh, has uh, problem. Indeed, I think the main challenge is when you think about Europe is completion of the single market. We, for those who live in Europe, you kind of forget that really the single market is really in manufacturing. It's in goods. Uh, in terms of services and other parts of, of the economy, Europe is just far from uh, being a, a single market. So there is a lot uh, that still needs to, needs to get done. And I'll mention some implications of that later on. Connected to it, obviously, is governance and effectiveness of policies. Europe could be much more effective. It's linked to the single market if the policies were uh, more effective. And then, obviously, the big challenge would be a trade war should one develop. Europe is right now sitting on the sidelines, uh, observing what's going on between uh, Washington and Beijing. But uh, it's not going to be an innocent bystander. It uh, will be affected one way or another. And it might as well uh, think of where it would be and how it wants to influence uh, events in case there are further uh, developments. And we know what an escalation can do. Remember the 1930s and the Great Depression, a lot of it was related, uh, the decline of uh, economic activity was related to, in fact, uh, uh, protectionist uh, and uh, tit-for-tat type, type measures that were uh, uh, put in place. 
So let's talk a little bit about the countries uh, in uh, Central Eastern Europe, the uh, new member uh, states. Um, obviously a very interesting region for the Institute. It's been uh, one of the very important points of economic activity, and the Institute has been really at the forefront of providing thinkers all over the world, analysts, uh, with uh, data analysis discussions. So, so this is uh, uh, the strength, in some sense, of uh, the place where the strength is for, for understanding. And I've, uh, in what I present, used, um, uh, with the kind perm permission of the management of the Institute, some of the data and studies of the Institute so that we wouldn't have to argue about uh, is this data right or not. So, so I'm using what's available from the IMF and various other places, but also, also the Institute. So the main features, obviously, the transition was uh, very important, going from um, uh, central planning and uh, uh, to a market economy. And I think here the importance conceptually is that uh, the thing is that you have both the initial conditions that we normally take into account when we look at economic development of countries around the world. But what was special about this region was that there were also what I call here terminal conditions in the sense that uh, these countries knew that they were heading into some well-defined space and there will be rules, regulations, uh, legal system, institutions that they have to match, fulfill, uh, fit into. Right? Uh, you basically don't have that anywhere else in the world. Mexico, with NAFTA, maybe you know, a little bit had to you know, adjust and so on and so forth. Uh, but nowhere else did you have a well-defined set of chapters, as it's called, right, to, to fit in. So you went from decades of central planning. These countries all had 40 years of uh, particular tight, straitjacket type system, move into uh, try to establish uh, the market. Geography was very important. Some of them are like Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, really very tightly uh, close uh, to, to Western Europe. Um, education is another important factor. When you think of these countries when they started, uh, they were at the level of uh, varying uh, degree of developing economies in terms of income per capita, but they differed from virtually all developing countries in the sense that they had highly educated population. Right? that you just don't find in normal developing countries that you would have not only complete literacy, but complete, you know, everybody educated very highly. So that was a feature that was very important in terms of uh, what happened subsequently. And coupled with that, so the geography position, education, etc., was a significant degree of inflow of foreign direct investment, followed later by portfolio investment as well. It varied by country uh, quite a lot, and we saw some of it you know, in the morning in the discussion, and, uh, but was key in recharging these economies, and then, of course, the EU destination which they had. So I think that's important to keep this in mind when one looks at what happened in these economies and what could happen or where they could go uh, and what their role and place in Europe and the global economy is. Obviously, um, they are are uh, relatively numerous, not quite uh, 100 million people, but you know, significant number. Um, but, um, but economically, there is a big question of how important they can be. So the main risks uh, here I see is the governance and effectiveness of the own policies within Cheeks. Uh, that I think is a big challenge. And then obviously of the European and uh, Euro area policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Cheeks. Uh, there are significant domestic political risks, which we are witnessing uh, right now uh, with uh, various ascent of various uh, autocratically oriented uh, groups, individuals, uh, uh, movements and parties. And uh, uh, the nationalism that's uh, growing in a number of these countries is a worrying feature. And obviously there is uh, uh, the geopolitical influence and uh, interests that Russia uh, has. And uh, should there be a um, global trade war or wars, the indirect effect on these countries would be quite significant. We already saw in the morning how open some of them are to, to international trade. Right. So that's sort of the uh, setting. Um, so let's now talk about um, the evolution. So let me start with, again, uh, the Madison project. Uh, uh, what they have done here is uh, look at the evolution from 1986, so before the fall of the Berlin Wall, okay, uh, to 2016. Uh, and um, if you 
yeah, you can see uh, what's supposed to be a 45 degree line or let's say a line through there. Uh, it gives you the sense of where the countries were. The horizontal axis is the 1986 and the vertical is uh, 2016. Now, um, it is, I should uh, stress for those of you who haven't gone through the data from that period, that's a heroic effort because uh, GDP was not measured at that point. Uh, there were a number and number of problems, but just mentioning two services were not really counted in national accounts at the time, so it was calculated. It was material product, gross or net material product. So to recalculate GDP, you had to add services uh, into it. Uh, prices were set by planners not to reflect scarcities, but to reflect priorities that they had. Um, so anyway, so all data of this kind have to be taken with a grain of salt. But if one is to trust somebody, I would say this is as uh, trustworthy as, or let's say, approximation of reality as one could have. So you know, just to get you oriented, so if you look at Austria, which is the point on the right up, it was in sort of 86% like of Germany. Germany is the top. Uh, uh, right-hand corner and move to roughly 96. Okay, so uh, improvement, convergence towards uh, towards the level of uh, uh, GDP per capita of Germany. What's interesting is that you have um, what you would expect, say, a country like Poland above the line, saying uh, it improved, uh, you know, moved, uh, converged uh, uh, from being below to being above, but then you have countries like Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, which according to these calculations actually did not <laughs> improve uh, uh, over time. And uh, I think the reason here primarily is that uh, these data take into account the big recession that occurred at the beginning of the 1990s. And uh, it may or may not be fair, it depends on the uh, goals that you have in terms of your research and uh, analysis to take it into account or not. I'm presenting it just so that you have it as a background because most other analysts will start in mid 90s or 2000, basically after the main transition uh, events occurred uh, because it's so difficult to reconstruct the data with a high degree of accuracy. But anyway, there is a debate about convergence, there is a debate about the relative standing of these countries, and so this is a good point to have in mind in addition to everything else. So here is uh, just to give you a sense of the size of this economy. I already said it's a, a large number of people. But when you compare the GDP that's being produced here relative to Germany, which is the upper line, uh, it basically is uh, very small when you express it in uh, current uh, exchange rate. Uh, when you do purchasing power uh, parity, it, you know, their importance increases somewhat, but it still is a big, big difference. So we have to realize it's numerically important in terms of population, in terms of the economic weight it's still a region which obviously isn't as high up as uh, one would uh, sort of assume, just sort of thinking of it geographically. Um, in terms of GDP per capita, so here you start getting a sense, and again, I'm reminding you, we're starting in 95, so after the big recession earlier on. Um, so yeah, the countries are sort of moving up, but so is our benchmark here, Germany. So uh, an improvement is there. You can see the... Uh, a uh, great recession uh, occurring there, temporarily slowing things down, but otherwise they are moving along. Okay, so fine. This is how it looks then in purchasing power uh, parity. And uh, again, everybody, the poor countries move up uh, uh, by that measure. Incidentally, my sense talking to people in um, at least the central European parts is they don't like being treated in purchasing power parity. They say we like to eat Gruyere and Brie cheese, not just the local cheese, so don't put us in purchasing power parity, put it at the exchange rate and real prices because uh, we uh, consume now differently than we used to before. But anyway, it's useful to get both of these as a, as a benchmark. Um, so here I've taken actually uh, data from a really important study of people who are here. The authors just updated it a little bit with Eurostat data to give you a sense of how these countries have done over time from 1995 on in different uh, sub-periods. Okay, you can take each of your uh, favorite country and, and look at how it did. The last three lines are probably the most instructive from our, for our purposes right now. You have the EU uh, 27 uh, and the, um, uh, sorry, the new member states, third from the bottom, the 10 countries with the rates of growth during these sub-periods. 
you have the uh, EU27 as a benchmark. So remember, it includes the uh, new member states. And then you have the last line is the difference. And you basically see that the uh, new member states are growing faster uh, virtually every period here that you have here. Uh, perhaps uh, worth noting is 2008 to 2012, where they also uh, grow faster, but that's mostly on account of Poland, which did not really go into a recession. It had a slowdown in the rate of economic growth, but didn't go into a recession. Many other countries did go, and some, like the Baltic states in particular, had very, very tough uh, decline. Uh, in uh, GDP and income, uh, associated income levels and so on. So, um, but, so uh, you, Western Europe was also affected by, by the recession. So you actually see that um, on uh, account of these indicators, uh, the new member states are uh, growing faster, are in a way converging, and uh, there are different periods when they are doing better and uh, other periods where they are not doing uh, so well. The early 2000s, for instance, were a period where they did very well. In fact, the first decade of this century uh, was there. So, um, and very recent data indicate, as we saw this morning, uh, that they are again doing quite well and are expected to do, to do relatively well. So, um, so in some sense, it's a very positive, optimistic story, and the question is why uh, are people in these countries not more happy, why uh, the populists and nationalists are gaining in number of them, and uh, it has to do probably with the speed of uh, the transition and convergence that really the expectations were just much higher than here. But let me just give you just a few things just to complete the picture. While there were significant bouts of inflation at the beginning of transition, basically uh, by now all these countries have uh, reached uh, low levels of inflation, just like uh, Germany and other countries in Europe. In fact, a number of them have been worried about going into deflation, taking possibly steps like the Czech National Bank, trying to intervene in order to uh, keep uh, uh, price level from, from declining. But basically, uh, the worries about inflation have faded away and have been replaced by worries about deflation, if anything. Right? So in that sense, these countries are not different from, uh, from the other countries in, uh, in Europe. Okay? Um, in terms of debt level, quite a lot of uh, diversity, variation in it. Some uh, had low uh, indebtedness, remained with low indebtedness. Others have uh, increased in part because of the fiscal measures undertaken during the Great Recession. But none of them really being, or very few being in the range, uh, relatively few being in the range where one would worry about it, uh, most of them are uh, well uh, sort of within the comfort, comfortable zone. Here is another picture of it to give you a few more of the uh, Western countries. And as you can see, countries such as Greece have a uh, much greater problem than many of the uh, transition uh, economies, the Central East European economies. So, uh, so again, in terms of the structure, yes, some of them have uh, issues that need to be uh, uh, looked after, but not with the extreme of Greece or what we don't have here, for instance, Italy uh, would be much more worrisome uh, as, a, as a country. In terms of current account balance statistics, you can see a number of them, uh, the decline and rise in terms of uh, the performance uh, or going into deficit during the Great Recession. Germany, of course, being uh, the benchmark, which in this case is quite anomalous com compared to other, other economies, Western economies uh, in Europe. Um, poverty rate, something very important, right? These countries started uh, relatively poor, and so the worry has been that there would be a significant increase in poverty, and indeed some of them, and poverty is measured, of course, in a way that's not uh, free of problems because you have to establish a benchmark and then uh, you measure relative to that benchmark. How that benchmark is set is uh, not without some controversy. Uh, so yes, uh, some of these countries obviously have um, uh, a significant part, 20% of the population, even more uh, above um, or below the poverty line. Uh, but even those that have very little, like the Czech Republic, have a lot of people bunched up right above the poverty line. 
uh, or um, yeah, right above. So should uh, there be a negative shock, suddenly you go from having low poverty to having much more prevalent poverty. So it depends a little bit how you measure it. Again, it's something that is an issue, but I would say it's an issue which uh, is not really uh, totally determining uh, what these countries are doing, although the rise of some of the populistic and nationalistic tendencies that I mentioned probably is correlated with uh, uh, the well-being of the bottom part of the population, which we see here. Um, incidentally, this slide and the next one, which gives you the Gini coefficient or the uh, measure of income inequality, um, again, these countries are either on the low end or kind of the middle of what would be observed in uh, um, mid-income and high-income economies. Uh, uh, the U.S. would be higher than, than this. China would be higher than, than this. So they are not uh, exceeding this. And the reason why poverty and income distribution, why poverty is more prevalent and income distribution is more prevalent is the social safety nets. These countries really were able to establish very uh, solid, again to varying degrees, but relatively uh, solid social safety nets, so that if you do analyses where you look how unequal uh, income distribution and wealth distribution, but in particular income distribution, would be if you had none of the uh, uh, social safety uh, nets, it would be much more uneven. But it really would be quite uneven. So it's driven back down to more equality. Uh, by the various uh, social programs from pensions, health, etc., continuing. The countries are very open to exports uh, on the whole. Uh, again, we have here Czech Republic, Slovenia, but Slovakia would be as well. Others less so, but still on average, they are relatively open uh, uh, trading economies. So uh, if there were to be a trade war, uh, indirectly, they would be affected very, very much. Uh, most of them are trading with the European Union, and, uh, and within European Union, Germany is, of course, the uh, big economy. That's why I'm using it as a benchmark throughout some of these, um, some of these comparisons. Um, let me now talk about something that really, I think, is at the heart of the main problem, and that's um, uh, incomes, wages, salaries that prevail in, in these economies. So here, just uh, to get us started, Leon Podkamir's study here shows you the evolution of the share that, of GDP that goes to labor. Okay, so GDP, if you simplify it, is what goes to capital and what goes to labor. So this is the share. And uh, Germany has a benchmark at the bottom, just telling you roughly half uh, of what's generated goes to workers and half goes to the capitalists or capital. Uh, Historically, actually, labor used to get more than 50%, you know, 60, even 70 in some economies. Now it's been going down over the last several decades. Uh, in some sense, uh, capital is getting more and more. And these, uh, in these countries, as you can see, Slovenia is roughly at the level of Germany, and the rest uh, labor is getting less than uh, half. It still doesn't look as bad as people feel, many people feel in these economies, but anyway, it's good to start thinking about it of sort of what the distribution is in terms of how we, uh, uh, how we think about the issues that arise. Um, so in particular, let's think of some other measures of wage and efficiency differentials. There are the standard, you know, when you take the average income that is in the country, compare it and say, you know, uh, income and wages in these economies are still very low after 30 years, virtually 30 years of the transition. Okay. You can do a little bit better. You can uh, control for uh, education experience. You can do those kinds of human capital earnings functions. The education, as I said, is very high in terms of years of education and so on and so forth. So you still will get uh, at uh, a level where uh, wages after 30 years are extremely low. Okay. Then you can go and do some more precise uh, uh, measures. So, for instance, you can take a particular firm that has a foreign parent and a local uh, subsidiary and say, you know, how different are they? So here I'll give you, for instance, the Škoda uh, auto company in Czech Republic and Volkswagen. And uh, everybody, including the management, will tell you that the efficiency is roughly the same. Uh, okay, so you don't really have much of a difference in terms of uh, the efficiency of production. Wages are one-third. 
Labor cost is one third. Okay? Used to be one fifth, but over 30 years, it only converged to one third. Okay? So you ask yourself, why is it that in a totally open economy that the European Union is, over the last uh, over 10 years, right, such a differential can persist? Uh, you it's can look. Hmm? This is a comparison of total labor cost that you pay per worker. And convert it to yeah, convert it current exchange rate. Right, exactly. Right. Um, you look at other like banks, for instance, and their subsidiaries. You get similar type of picture. Uh, there is a very interesting study that's being done by Professor Ashenfelter at Princeton and Uraida at Sergii, where they look at um, uh, McDonald's. Now, why they look at McDonald's? Uh, the reason they look at McDonald's is that they can take a person who does exactly the same task, namely producing a Big Mac, okay? And they do it everywhere around the world, okay? And they say, so this person uses the same equipment, same ingredients, produces an identical, totally identical product in same hygienic conditions, everything, everywhere. That's why you go to McDonald's, you don't get sick, it's hygienic, same, same way, everywhere. And, uh, and the question is, how many Big Macs can you buy in an hour, after an hour of work? Right? So here you really standardize as well as you can in a way, so it's very ingenious. And to give you a sense, um, the Czechs earn half of the Big Macs of what the Austrian workers earn. If you love Big Macs, work in Vienna, not in Prague. But uh, it's basically an interesting thing. So here is a 50%, okay? Uh, the wage is 50% of what it is in two neighboring economies where movement of workers is uh, totally possible no particular skills needed, right? So there is a huge differential. And the interesting thing is that even when you go to the border, the differential doesn't really go down, at least not uh, noticeably. Whereas uh, in North Mexico, near the US border, wages are three times as high as in the interior of Mexico, right? So the proximity here, you go to Pilsen, which is near German border, or take whatever town you like, and uh, the differentials are not eroding even after 30 years. Right? So that's a puzzle for you. I'd like the answer for you at the end. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about study that I've been doing with Yuri Gorodnichenko and Deborah Revoltella and uh, Christoph Weiss at the European Investment Bank, where we are asking about the efficiency of capital and labor allocation. The idea is uh, quite simple. If you have um, labor and capital allocated in such a way, that you could move a worker from one use to another and increase that worker's productivity, okay, you increase GDP, right? So to the extent that marginal products are not equalized uh, in, in the economy, the economy is not as efficient as it could be if you had equal marginal products. So with a particular uh, survey that was being done by the European Investment Bank, we have uh, looked at the extent to which this equalization is not taking place. And uh, the result, which I got calculated for, for us here, is that the cheeks, the CE countries, relative to the European Union average, so on average, the countries in Central Eastern Europe um, are 10% below Western Europe in terms of uh, efficiency of allocation. So if they reallocate it to the level where Western Europe, uh, European Union as a whole is, uh, they would raise their GDP by 10%. Okay. Uh, if they were to become as efficient as Germany, um, it would be a 20% differential, 0 0.8 to 1. Okay. So there is allocative inefficiency, which could be still improved in these economies, and they could do, uh, they could do much better. Incidentally, uh, if you compare Europe to the United States, Europe as a whole, it's at 20%. European GDP could increase by 20% or more if it had allocation like the United States. And the US is not perfect. It also doesn't have equalization. So um, there is a lot for Europe still to gain by uh, more efficient allocation. Um, some other features that I think are important. My migration was already mentioned, so migration to the old uh, member states. Uh, some of it is within professions. Doctors go to Germany, uh, OK? Uh, the workers who went to Britain, in some sense, were part of the decision for Brexit, right? It was not a worry about workers from Pakistan or India. 
uh, it was worried about the Polish and other uh, workers who were moving to Britain that generated part of the sentiment for voting for, for Brexit. So uh, uh, this is where these countries played their part, uh, to go back to the title of my lecture, uh, in terms of generating major, potentially major changes. Um, the um, uh, EIB study also is indicating that there is still lower average quality of uh, capital stock. So if you look at the share of machinery equipment that is perceived to be state of the art, it's 35% uh, uh, in uh, the new member states versus 45% in the EU uh, on average. Uh, which I was actually surprised that the EU isn't, isn't higher, but uh, anyway, this is what the data are, are suggesting. So let me just give you a quick Czech-Slovak comparison, which is interesting because the two countries started from uh, one country, so it's an interesting case study just to have as a vignette. This is uh, showing you the uh, gross national income per capita in purchasing power system parity, and you have uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and the EU uh, 28, so all of them are increasing. Clearly, Slovakia, the yellow line, is approaching uh, the Czech Republic very successfully, um, converging on this uh, criterion alone. This is um, the uh, gross national inco income per capita as percent of the EU 28. So here you can see, yes, there is an increase uh, for the Czech Republic, not particularly uh, uh, powerful, and you can see it goes down with a hiccup during the Great Recession, but Slovakia doing quite well uh, for a number of reasons, including, including reforms, really important reforms that were undertaken, uh, economic reforms. Um, here is uh, a comparison which is based on uh, uh, just GDP, where you can see again the convergence, but much less uh, uh, pronounced, and uh, the Czech Republic also growing uh, as percent of uh, EU28, but not, again, not very markedly. Once you take uh, a measure, AIC, which measures the uh, consumption uh, of people, including services provided by the government, you can see that Slovakia actually converged um, and, uh, and has been uh, for about the last seven, eight years at about the same level. So depending on uh, how you... Uh, which criteria you measure, which is one of the points that I'm trying to make here, you will get a different answer to the question. But there is this uh, incredible sort of uh, puzzle as to why the um, uh, salaries have not been equalizing more, why has the labor costs just not been equalizing. There is, and we heard again this morning, significant increase in wages this year, so there is some catching up taking place uh, this year and uh, possibly going forward. But um, but it is, uh, it is a, a big question, uh, unresolved. So, um, where is Europe and the Central East European countries uh, and the crossroads? So the question is, can Europe stay together and continue integration? I think that's the fundamental big question that's um, being asked by people in Europe, people outside of Europe who are observing Europe, right? Do you achieve uh, more of a single market, really uh, creating a single market beyond manufacturing? Can there be greater policy coordination? And uh, obviously how it can be achieved politically. Then the big challenge, which is being recognized, I think, everywhere, is uh, can the economic growth, which has finally taken place after years of uh, stagnation and some countries decline, some countries slow growth, can it be maintained? Okay, so is there uh, something that can be there? And more importantly, can Europe raise its uh, innovation, innovativeness? Some of you may remember that in 2000, Europe set itself a 10-year goal that it will become the most dynamically uh, dynamic and innovative part of the world, the so-called Lisbon strategy. Well, in 2008, I remember I was at a meeting in Brussels where everybody says, well, we haven't accomplished it, but in 10 years, the second decade, we are definitely going to do it. So right now the European Commission has come up with a 500-page study indicating why in the next 10 years we'll, we'll do it. So, uh, so the question is, uh, you know, um, in digital technology, uh, artificial intelligence, robotization, you know, the frontier, why are the top 10 firms in the world, why is there not a single European firm, right? Six are American, uh, three are Chinese, one is... Um, Korean, Japanese, depending how you look at it. So I think this is really the key, key thing, and obviously the cheeks are in the midst of it. So uh, 
Their question is, will they remain in the European Union uh, or will there be centrifugal tendencies uh, following Brexit? Uh, can they speed up the convergence in the particular the area where they are so worried about, namely, namely wages? Will they diversify their export destination? Probably not. Will they raise value added of exports? They should be able to, but uh, that's a big question. Um, they are educated, but the quality of education is not uh, at the top notch. When you sort of look at Central Eastern Europe and ask how many universities are in the top 100, uh, by any of the rankings, international rankings, it's none. Top 200, none. Top 300, none. So they have extremely good athletes, extremely good artists, etc., but they just have not placed emphasis on the quality, recognized quality, in a world where increasingly the winner takes most, if not all. Right? So that that's clearly has to be. And then they have to avoid uh, authoritarianism. So let me, uh, I've given you a you know, very diverse uh, set of views. So let me just uh, end by uh, sharing with you what John Major uh, was uh, telling us at dinner when he first uh, met Boris Yeltsin and said, you know, it was a short meeting, but Boris tell me in one word, how's the economy? And Yeltsin thinks this is good. He says, well, and Major says, that, that was a bit too quick. Tell me in two words. And he says, not good. <laughs> so thank you very much.